six, and then we'll get into our list. I gotta cut it off somewhere. <laughs> I love this song. Every time I sing it, you know a certain song just reminds you of people? Every time I sing this, I think of my Granny Bates. God, I love her. I still do. She just ain't here with us anymore. Mm -hmm. teachers anymore because they don't want to have to deal with Christian values being taught in school. So now if you're a teacher in Arizona and you want a job, you can't tell them you're a Christian or they will not hire you. That's the news story that's out out of Arizona. It's going to eventually happen everywhere. They are cracking down on Christians. They don't want Christians because they think Christians are judgmental because we believe that God is judge and we believe in doing right. Huh? I don't see how they can do that. I don't see how they can. You can't discriminate against people for different reasons. And I would think that would be discrimination because you're a Christian. 
And they tried to keep Amy Coney Barrett out of the Supreme Court because she was a Christian. They questioned her. You remember that when the Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett was being qualified and verified? She's a Catholic. She's a Christian. And they were trying to say, how are you going to judge on the Supreme Court without letting your Christian faith get in the way of judgment? I would like to believe that her Christian faith helps her in judgment, but they didn't want her in there. And I'm telling you, that's the country we're in. I didn't think I'd live to see it, but that's the country we're in. And that's a perfect segue right into the Scriptures. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 12. Woo! Woo! Hey, ain't nothing wrong, Hall. <laughs> I'll do it for you. It don't matter. Listen, I like to get excited about the Word of God because there ain't nothing else excites me anymore. This world is nuts. I used to get excited about going to do stuff that I thought would be fun, you know. Go bowling, get excited. Go uh, roller skating, get excited. Go, you know, go fishing, get excited. You know, nothing really excites me anymore. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I want to go y'all. I want to go home. This ain't my home. You ever been, you ever been visiting somebody and it was fun? I remember the first time I ever stayed the night at somebody else's house. I got all jittery about it. Because I never slept outside of my own bed before. I'd never gone to nobody else's house and stayed the night. And I remember the first time my mama let me go and stay with a friend. I got over and we played until we were so tired. And I remember right there at bedtime, I got a little bit homesick. Not too much, mind you. But as I was laying down there, I was like, this is weird. This ain't my bed. This ain't my room. This ain't my house. This ain't my parents. But it's going to be all right. People have done this before and lived through it. So I stayed the night. Next morning, my friend's dad got up and made his pancakes. Ooh, they were good. And I just remember I had a really good time. But when it's time to go home, I was ready to go home. And I remember there's been times when I, when I grew up in Paris, Texas. And I remember the first time I was old enough to drive and I left town to go somewhere else, Dallas probably, because we lived about... 60 miles from Dallas. So I remember being in Dallas and, and I remember coming back toward Paris and seeing the city limit sign and that's, that, that, that the emotion that comes up. Oh, I'm almost home, right? Anybody besides me ever done that? So if you think that's a good feeling, imagine what I got in my sights. It's a city limit sign. The city's called heaven. Jesus is Lord of that place and it's just on the horizon. I'm almost there, y'all. I'm just almost there. And I'm getting excited just talking about it. We better get into 1 Samuel chapter 12. Look, y'all stay here if you want to. I want to go home. All right, anyway. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Now, when we left off, I, I told you Saul has now been officially anointed king. And remember, they had to hunt for him. He, didn't, he wasn't really excited about this position. They had to hunt for him, and then they got him found, and then they had a crisis, and in a crisis... He yielded to the Spirit of the Lord, and the Lord upon him helped him and Israel to defeat their enemies. And so we looked at that. We looked at that in the last chapter, and that's where we left off. So he's, he, he, it was the Ammonites that they fought against, and he's looking pretty good with the people right now. He's, he's listening to the Lord. He's listening to Samuel. He's leading the people into victory. And so far, so good. Chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, And Samuel, remember this is the prophet, that raised up under Eli, who has been judging Israel until his old age. And he's up there in years. I don't know how old he is at this point. I think it tells us later. But it doesn't say in this chapter. Samuel said to all of Israel, while they had them gathered, you know, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that you said unto me, and have made a king over you. Now, I don't know what the occasion is. But if I had to guess, I'd say they're throwing a party because they just want a big battle. And you've got the leaders of the people gathered together. There's probably not a way. What is that? I think it's going on the phone. Is that mine? Yes, that's yours. I'm getting there. Yeah, that's right. I was trying to ignore it. Somebody really wants to get old. Holy, it might be worse. What was... Your chapter 12. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. Okay. And just to try to explain what I think is going on, it tells us he's talking of all of Israel. I don't know that there's a way to address all of Israel. Um, there's over 3 million people came out of Egypt. So probably a pretty good group at this point. 
Enrique will help you. He's pretty savvy with those things. We'll find a way to put it on style on time. Yeah, that's on style. <laughs> <laughs> or if you need to, take it. But just whatever. Anyway, <laughs> what I think is happening here is they just won this battle against the Ammonites, and Samuel's got a pretty good group of leaders gathered around. And so by delegation, he does reach all of Israel, because as he tells the leaders, leaders tell people unto them, and it works its way out. That's just the way they did it in that day. They didn't have social media, so... Um, and even if they did, we have social media, I don't see everything on it. You have to be told, it has to be delegated down. But anyway, notice what he tells them. As he's talking to Israel, he says, Behold, look, I have hearkened unto your voice. I've done what you asked. You wanted a king? You've got a king. I've done what you asked me to do, and I've also done what the Lord asked me to do. So watch this, verse 2. And now behold, the king walketh before you. He's here. It's not a figment of your imagination. Not something you have to ask for, wish for, hope for. He's here. You got it. He says, and I am old and gray-headed. Now, that don't necessarily mean anything. I know a lot of gray-headed people. I wouldn't call old just yet. <laughs> At least not to their face. <laughs> but, but this is what he says. He says, I'm old and I'm gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. You remember Samuel's story. From the time he was born, he was dedicated by his mother Hannah to serve God at the temple. Now, what's beautiful about that is just because you dedicate a child to the Lord doesn't mean they're going to honor the Lord, does it? How many of you raised your children with, in dedicating them to the Lord with all hopes that they would serve God with all they've got? Some of them do, some of them don't. It's ultimately up to him. And that's what's beautiful about Samuel. His mama may have given him to the Lord, but it's up to Samuel to make that decision for himself that he's going to follow the Lord and do what the Lord wants him to do. And the same is true with you and me, friend. It don't matter how good mama raised us. It don't matter how many times we've drugged the church, people joke and say, well, I have a drug problem. I would drug the church every time the doors was open, three times a week, all through the revival, and any time there was something extracurricular, we went. Any church-sanctioned event, if the church was frying fish, we were there. And I remember them days, okay? But just because you drag somebody to church and teach them everything that you learn in church doesn't mean they're going to go. Samuel's saying here, look, from my childhood unto now, and, and you'll meet people like this, I do. People, I had somebody tell me, man, I've been in church since nine months before I was born, right? I've heard people say that. And, and, that, and that does happen, right? But that don't necessarily mean that you stay with it in honor of the Lord. But see, Samuel has. And they know that. He doesn't have to even tell them that. They know that. His testimony is true. From his childhood all the way up till this day, he has walked in front of Israel serving God. I wish we could all say that. But moving on. Verse 3. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, meaning King Saul. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it. That's a bold statement. And I'm going to tell you something. I couldn't make it. I couldn't go on national TV and say, if I've ever took from you, if I've ever lied to you, if I've ever mistreated you, look at my face. If you see me and I've ever wronged you, I haven't, but if I have, I'll make it right. If I went on national TV tomorrow and did that, somebody come out of woodwork. You know why? Because I have not served Christ from my youth up to now. There are people who knew me all through my 20s and 30s who would see me and say, oh, that guy's awful. Oh, he's, he did me all kinds of dirt. He, he mistreated me this way and that. He, he punched me in the nose. He, 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 he slapped you know, I don't know, just something. But there'd be somebody say something about me. Um, this is a bold statement. And it speaks to the character of Samuel here. Because nobody's perfect. I'm sure he did something he wasn't supposed to do. But if he did, nobody caught it. Because he just gave them their opportunity to call him out. Anybody he's ever cheated. Anybody he's ever mistreated. And that's a bold thing to say. And I, I, have to, uh, I have to admire that. I wish we had politicians that would stand up and say something like that. I do. I wish we had politicians that would stand up on all the news networks, all of them, the, the mainstream media and everybody else, stand up and say, I have not wronged anybody. Find what I've done. And, and, and it'd be true. Man, wouldn't this be a better country 
if we just had people who could say, I have served God from my childhood till now, and try as you might, you won't find anything I've done to hold against me because I have honored the Lord with my life. I wish we had people like that. I'd follow a fellow like that. But anyway, that's this is why I'm bringing you, you got to be thinking by now, why is he belaboring this point? We get it, right? I'll tell you why. This is the guy they traded for a kid that they don't know anything about. They've got this guy who they can trust, who has lived. The, it's, it's so funny how quickly we forget people who have been faithful. So funny how quickly young people forget their elders. It breaks my heart, but today young people don't have any respect for elders. I remember growing up, if you saw a person, and I'm not going to call anybody elderly, we'll call you mature, because some of you are. But there was a time when I was growing up, if you saw somebody up there in years walking toward a door, you'd open the door for them. If you saw them reaching for something, you'd get it for them. Not because they can't, but because you're there and you can. Or in some way, form, or fashion, you defer to their judgment. Ask them for their advice. Listen to what they got to say. I remember sitting on the porch of my granddad. And if I had had half a brain, I wrote down nearly everything I heard him say. I wish I took that class. Those reporters, uh, what do you call them, court reporters? Stenographer. Stenographer, thank you. <laughs> I wish I took that class. And I wish I'd had a stenographer machine and knew how to use it and just sat around, you know, the older generation when I was a kid. If I'd have had a brain and I'd have known what I know today, I'd have done that. And I would have learned some stuff. You're not going to learn it. See, you don't learn everything on Google. You think you do, but you don't. There's a lot of wisdoms passed away and gone because we didn't pass it down. And so it bugs me that you've got this old man who has done everything he can do to make Israel successful. But unfortunately, it don't matter how good he is if nobody follows him. And they've traded him in for a younger model. Oh, they're making a mistake and they can't even see it. And that's why I'm belaboring the point. He says, if I've defrauded anybody, if I've taken a bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, meaning turn the blind eye to wickedness because somebody paid me to, he said, I'll give you back your money. Just, just make the accusation. Verse 1, they said, Thou hast not defrauded us or oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. So by their own testimony, this man is good. This is somebody worthwhile to lead the nation. I wish Samuel was running for office in the United States of America today because, friends, not only would I vote for him, I'd work for the campaign for free. I'd make up signs. I'd put out commercials. That's the guy I want leading my country right there. But that's not what they want. They want young and stupid, evidently. Anyway, verse 5. And he said unto them, The Lord is a witness against you. And his anointed, he's talking about Saul, is witness this day that you have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, he is witness. What a thing to say. Okay, fine. God's witness and God's witness. Saul's witness and Saul's witness. You've done nothing wrong. We're not firing you because you did something wrong. We just don't want to follow you. It's sad. But anyway, verse 6. Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron. And, and, and let me explain that. There were a lot of people back then who held Moses in high regard. Have you ever wondered why God didn't let Moses die among the people? I mean, he died. Don't get me wrong. The Bible says in Jude that the devil and the archangel Michael are fighting over his body. There's a reason for that too I won't get into tonight. But just... It's, it, it's something interesting if you want to study into it. In part because of what I'm fixing to tell you. But have you ever wondered why God didn't let Moses die among the people? Anybody, anybody ever wonder that? Would you like to know why that happened? Same thing with Elijah. You ever wonder why God took Elijah up in a fiery chariot and didn't leave him here? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you why. They'd have made an idol of him. They'd have gone to his grave and worshipped the thing because that's the way people are. They get so encapsulated with men and great men and things that men have done and they start to think they're something big. Listen, it was never Moses. In fact, if you're being honest, Moses didn't want the job. When God appeared to him in a burning bush, he said, go and free my people. He said, not me. I can't even talk. And remember, God told him, he said, I made your mouth. I made it. You can do what I tell you to do because I'm going to help you do it. Moses didn't even want the job. But they held him. It's funny because when he was alive, they're all the time looking for occasion to overthrow him or kill him. But after he died, he was the standard. 
And they throw him up at everybody. They even threw Moses up at Jesus. Have y'all read that in the New Testament? They even threw him up at Jesus. You ever had somebody that would throw people up to you that they think are better than you? Anybody ever have that happen? I've had it happen to me. When I got to Faith Baptist Church in Hamilton, the whole first year I was there, this one particular man told me, he said, I like you, Brother Chad, but you ain't Brother Don. You just ain't Brother Don. Well, I know I'm not Brother Don. I didn't come here to be Brother Don. You see, Brother Don, I'm not here anymore, right? But anyway, I, I've had people compare me. I get it. But they threw Moses up at Jesus. How stupid is that? So, in other words, they're holding Moses in high regard. So I want you to notice what Samuel tells them about Moses, probably because they think a little too much of Moses and not near enough of the God of Moses. Do you follow me? You understand what I'm saying? So he says in verse 6, Samuel said to the, people, to the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord Almighty God, the great I Am, that's who did it. Verse 7, Now therefore, Stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord. That means be quiet, hush, and listen. That's what that means. He says, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which He did to you and to your fathers. Now, He's going to start to give an overview. And let me tell you, He don't cover everything. He's just hitting the highlights here, so we're going to move quickly. Verse 8. When Jacob was coming to Egypt, and your father cried unto the Lord. Then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. So just to, uh, just to explain that in a nutshell, he's saying God gave you this land completely free and clear. There was no note at the bank. There's not a bunch of building needed done. He gave you the land with the houses, with the farms, with the animals. It was all here. He gave it to you. And because of your wickedness, He put you into bondage against the uh, people you were supposed to drive up. Verse 10. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve thee. Now that happened all through the book of Judges, and he's just giving you a quick overview of it. What he's saying is, all through this time of the Judges, and remember, Samuel's the last judge. He's saying, you keep putting yourself in this position. Look at verse 11. And the Lord sent Drubal for extra credit. Who can tell me who Drubal is? A more common name for Drubal. I taught y'all this. We studied it. I taught y'all this. The other name for who? Somebody, anybody impressed me. Who is Drubal? Gideon. 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 I taught y'all that when we studied the book of Judges. Name my son Gideon after that guy. They called him Drubal. That was not his name. Because they called him that because he cut down. The reason Baal's in his name is because he cut down the grove that his father worshipped that was set up for Baal. So basically the guy who destroyed Baal is what that means. It was a nickname for Gideon. So they're interchangeable. When you see Drubal, and I told y'all this, when you see Jerubel, that is Gideon. That's who that is. He said, the Lord sent Gideon, and Bedan, and Jephthah, these are all judges, and Samuel, he's talking about himself here, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwell safe. And when you saw, this is the most recent battle, the one in the last chapter. So he's caught up now to current events, okay? Verse 12. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, y'all remember what this... This jerk said to them, y'all remember what he said? He said, I won't attack you if everybody takes out their right eye. Y'all remember that? We studied that in the last chapter. He said, I'll, I'll leave you alone, but y'all got to take your right eye out. It was either do that or I'm going to conquer you, kill you. So, I mean, they, they were stuck. And he's reminding them, he said, when that guy came against you, you said to me, nay, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your king, you chose a man over your God. Before, they would choose an idol over their God, an idol over their God. I, hey, they made an upgrade. Now they don't want an idol, they want a man. Did you know that's how the whole wide world is going to fall for the Antichrist? Because they don't want a God, and they're tired of serving idols, they're going to want a man. And they're going to get one, but he ain't going to be the right one. After we're out of here, y'all do know the Antichrist is going to take over completely, right? 
and they're going to bow right down to him like idiots. It's, uh, it's sad. But anyway, in verse 12 says, A king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Verse 13, Now therefore, behold, the king whom you have chosen. And you're going to say, well, God chose him. That's true. But they didn't have to accept him. They ratified the thing. And, and, and I'm convinced. God didn't choose Saul because God wanted Saul. God chose Saul because he knew Saul would be acceptable to the people. He was tall, he was handsome, he was strong, he was young. He had all the attributes. He knew. Look, God knows Israel just like God knows you. God knew what Israel wanted. God knows what you want. Just because you want something don't make it okay. Right? God knows what the deepest desires of your heart are. And so he knew his people would accept this man. So when he says, you chose him, that's what he's talking about. God chose him, and God chose what they wanted, and they agreed to the deal, okay? Therefore, behold, the king you have chosen, and whom you have desired, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Long story short, Samuel said, you got what you wanted. This whole chapter so far is a long diatribe where Samuel was reminding the people, you asked for it, you got it. You shouldn't have, you did. Here we go with what you wanted. Watch out. Look at verse 13. 14. If, this is why I love the Lord so much. You want to know why I love God so much? Because even though we are such a broken people and we sin against Him every day, He loves us so much, so much, so very much, that even in the depth of our depravity, He still makes a way for us to be successful. He still shows His love and mercy for us even when we're not even paying him any attention. You will never understand this side of heaven just how much your God loves you. And it's not just because he sent his son for you. He did. He sent his son to redeem you and save you. But it's so much more than that. Since he did that, he continues to do for you, provide for you, care for you, love you, give you opportunity after opportunity to be successful in, 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 in all that he calls you to do. This is an example of that. Verse 14, he just told them how stupid they are for wanting the king. Now watch what he says here. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both you and also this king guy that you wanted that reigns over you continue following the Lord your God. It's real simple. It's real simple. God didn't want to have a king, but you got your way. Have you ever asked God for something knowing good and well you shouldn't be asking for it? Have you ever said these words to the Lord? In, in your own private prayers, this is rhetorical, please don't answer out loud. But have you ever said to God in your prayers, Lord, if you just give me this one little thing, I'll serve you, I'll, I'll, I'll go to church every Sunday, I'll sing in the choir, I'll do all that, I'll even tell somebody about you every now and then, Lord, I, I will do things better if you just give me this thing. Anybody else has ever done this? Don't answer that. I'm just... Basically what Israel did. They wanted a king, they wanted a king, they wanted a king, they got a king, and he's still telling them, God will still honor and bless you if you'll just obey him. Even though you've got a king, listen to the Lord, follow the Lord, honor the Lord. That's pretty clear in verse 14, look at verse 15. But, oh, that's a hard word right there. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Y'all wanted a king, you got it, but you better do better than your daddies did. That's what that's saying. Let me ask you a question. This is rhetorical. Don't answer this. Answer it to yourselves. Answer it to God. Let me ask you this. Has anybody ever wanted to be better than their parents were? Does anybody think they are? Don't answer that. Do you think you do it better than your mom did? Do you think you do it better than your dad did? Do you think there's a pathway for you to be successful so that your children and grandchildren will look at you like you look at them? Let me answer that for you, for me. If you're talking about my mom and dad, yeah, I think I got them beat. But go one more generation. Talk about my grandparents. No, sir, no, ma'am. I, so far, so far below where I'd like to be. But someday, 
Not for my own glory, but because I want to honor God. Someday, when I leave this world, I want my children and my grandchildren to remember me somewhat like I remember my grandparents. Knowing that I served the Lord and they saw it. I want to leave that impression, don't you? Let's do. Look, the same thing he told Israel, the same thing he's telling you. It don't matter who's in the White House. It don't matter who's in the governor's mansion. It doesn't matter who's the mayor of the local city. What matters is, are you honoring God with your life? Are you doing the things He called you to do? Do you love Him and are you showing Him that love by the way you live your life? Verse 16. Now therefore, this is cool. <laughs> if y'all haven't read ahead, you should have. This is pretty neat. Verse 16. Now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? Now, this is probably another reason they're gathered together. Because everybody had to help each other gather wheat during wheat harvest. First time I ever read this verse, I didn't understand it. And I don't know that I understand it now, but I've got an idea what he's talking about. So let me share this with you. If y'all didn't read ahead, you need to start. You'll get more out of it if you know where I'm going, okay? Because the more I have to explain, it, the harder it is to get in depth here. But listen to me. I didn't know until this past couple of years, just recently, I don't remember what year exactly, but in the past few years, I, I learned something about Israel I did not know. How many of you think you know how much rain they get annually? Anybody? The whole nation in the, in the course of a year. How much rain do they get? <laughs> Roughly three inches. Now that can vary. They can have years they get a little more, years they get a little less. Man, we sometimes get that much in one big rain. They get about three inches of rain a year. I don't know how in the world they survive like that, but they do. You can look that up. That's, that's something you can look up. You can, you can call me on it if I'm wrong. But that's something I learned recently. So here's the point. It don't rain there a whole lot. Now, they have a rainy season. They have times where they get rain. And they probably get a lot of dew, and I don't think anybody counts that. But just actual rainfall, it's not a lot. And what's neat about that is that's one of the most fertile places on the planet. God has made it that way. You can go over there in the Jezreel Valley and plant stuff and it'll grow all day long. It's, it's a very, very fertile place in some areas of Israel that just, it's amazing to me. I can't explain it to you. It's not all desert like, like you would think with that little bit of rain. But anyway, and, that, and that's, that's pretty interesting. But with that in mind, look at verse 17. Is it not we harvest today? I will call unto the Lord. He shall send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. Now, the first time I ever read that when I was a younger man, I thought, what's so special about thunder and rain? We get it all the time. If I see thunder and rain, I don't immediately get scared and think God's mad at me. Why is this significant? I'll tell you why. It was usually dry. and they, If they're prepared to harvest wheat, they're expecting dry weather. You don't gather to harvest wheat wheat if you got clouds in the sky. Y'all know, know enough about farming to know that. You're not going to do it in the rain. Anybody ever seen a combine run in the rain? Me neither. They, they, they don't do that. So they wait for a dry spell and then they, they do their, their harvesting. So they're not expecting rain. It's not in the forecast. It was on nobody's apple phone back then. So anyway. Samuel says you're going to see a great thing. He says I'm going to call on the Lord. He's going to give thunder and rain so you'll know that what you've done here in asking for this king was wrong. Verse 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. That shocked them. There was a song growing up, and I shouldn't even reference this, but I will because I've got the time. When I was growing up, there was a song. It was uh, by, uh, I think it's Loretta Lynn, called Lizzie and the Rain Man. Anybody heard that? Whole songs about... Uh, Step back, unbeliever, or the rain will never come. Somebody, oh, is it Tanya Tucker? Anyway, whoever does the song, it's about <laughs> some idiotic rain guy is going to bring rain, but you got to believe. You gotta believe. It's the dumbest song in the world. But anyway, it's famous. I mean, they used to play on radio all the time. If you haven't heard it, that's okay. It doesn't matter. But there was a time where people believed in rain dances and, and all of these different things they would do to try to make the rain come. Which is so silly because the Lord has control of the rain. So imagine before, before Native Americans were doing rain dances and before Tanya Tucker was even alive. Way back to this point, 
They had never witnessed somebody make it rain on command. They had never seen that. Nobody had ever seen it. And I'm going to tell you now, even weathermen who study it all their lives don't always get it right, do they? Hey, they'll tell you it's going to rain and it don't. They'll tell you it ain't and it will. So people don't know. So if you're standing there in this group and you hear this guy say, God's not happy with y'all. He's had it with the way that you won't stay true to Him. And you've asked for this king and you shouldn't have, but he's still going to make a way. And by the way, just to show you what I'm telling you is ratified, verified by God. Watch this. And then he calls for rain and thunder. And it happens. Can you imagine being there? Look, 2,000 years later, if somebody said something like that and then it happened, it would still freak me out Okay, if I was there. So this is what they're witnessing. They're witnessing this great thunder and this great rain. And they all feared the Lord and Samuel at the end of verse 18. They, they, they are, they're scared. Verse 19. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. I like the way that's worded. They said, uh oh, we have messed up. Please pray for us, because not only have we sinned against God, we've added to our wickedness that we'd already committed in idolatry by asking for this man to be a king over us. And this is all a foreshadowing of the Antichrist that somebody's going to want in place someday later. But guess what? After King Saul is going to come King David. And after the Antichrist is going to come the son of David, Jesus Christ our Lord, the one rightful true king of all things. So it's all going to work out. But I just want you to see that they recognize that they have sinned. And the sad thing is, they still want him. Verse 20. Samuel said to the people, Fear not. You have done all this wickedness. Yet, turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Translation, even with everything you put him through, even with every way you've grieved him, even with every way you've dishonored him, even with every way that you have failed him, even with every way you have made him ashamed of you, he still loves you. He still makes a way for you to be successful. Just get in his will and follow what he told you to do. It's the same message to Israel that it is to the church. Just follow the Lord. There have been some churches put way too much stock in their pastor. And I'm not going to call any out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There are some churches that they just worship their pastor. A little too much, if you ask me. I'm going to tell you now. I don't want nobody worshiping me. I don't even want y'all to listen to me directly. I just want you to maybe... Take whatever I tell you and go to the Lord with it. And serve Him. Follow Him. If you follow me, you're going to mess up. Because I'm going to mess up. I told y'all that when I came here. I never came here and made y'all promise that I was going to live perfectly righteous all the time. I told y'all from day one. I will mess up. I will let you down. Follow Jesus. Don't follow me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm doing the best I can and I'm going to let you down. But He never will. But there are churches out there that are worshiping their pastor. And they have the same problem that Israel had. They think their answer's in some man. Answer ain't in no man. Answer's in Jesus Christ your Lord. Serve ye Him with all your heart. And don't follow anybody that don't tell you that very same thing. It ain't got to be me, but make sure whoever you're listening to is saying those same words. Verse 21. Turn you not aside, but then should you go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver. For they are vain. Now he's trying to give you a warning here. Don't skim over that. He's saying when you turn away from God, you'll find yourself following things that just don't matter. Let me give you one of them. Money. Money's nice to have and we all need it to live. But if you get a little too wrapped up in having money, it, you'll begin to see how vain it is. I've known lots of, I really haven't known them, I've known of lots of rich people that are miserable. They're miserable because they found out the hard way money didn't solve all their problems and make them happy. Helps to have it, but let me say this too. A whole load, a, a truckload of money will bring with it a truckload of problems you're not used to having. I used to joke about this, it's not really funny. But if somebody gave me, say, $100 million tomorrow, 
the first thing I have to do is hire a whole SWAT team to protect my kids. Because the first thing somebody does, do is, oh, he's got $100 million? Let me take one of the kids and sell them back one at a time. I don't have that problem. I don't have to worry about anybody taking my kids and trying to, I have to worry about people taking them, but I don't have to worry about anybody taking them and trying to sell them back to me. I ain't got no money to buy them back. I don't have that worry. So just, I don't mean that to be funny. I'm just saying, money just causes more problems than it solves. And, and money's not the only thing he's talking about here. He's just saying, be careful what you set your heart on, what you follow. Because when you turn your heart away from God, you'll go after vain things, things that will bring you nothing. They cannot profit you in the end. And, and, and let me just say it this way, and I'm, I'm going to finish the chapter, but if I had $100 million, I can't take it with me to heaven. I can't. And my life here is limited. I'm more concerned about the eternal things than I am the temporal things. And you should be too. Verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake His people. And that's true for the church too. The Lord will not forsake His people. For His great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you His people. And I'm going to tell you, because of what Israel did to Jesus, it has pleased the Lord to make you His people. We don't replace the church, but we've got a special place in His heart. Verse 23, Moreover, as for me, He's talking about sin. The same is what I'm going to tell you. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Did y'all catch that? Back there in verse 19, people said, Samuel, pray for us, pray for us. And he tells them, look, I'll pray for you. Just remember, you need to do what you're supposed to do. And I'll tell you the same thing. When you call me and ask me to pray for you, I always say, yes, I will. I will pray for you. I will always pray for you. I will. I'll pray for anybody who wants me to. I love you. But just because you ask me to pray for you, that doesn't clear things for you. You've still got to follow the Lord. Because I can pray till I'm blue in the face. If you're not honoring God, why would He answer the prayer? And, and, and Samuel tells him that. He says, you do right by God and me. God forbid I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you. That's an old fancy English way of saying, I'm going to continue to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. I've got a whole sermon entitled, not tonight, but I've got a whole sermon title based on that verse. He says, I will not cease to pray for you, but I'm going to teach you the good and the right way. Friends, that's what I'm here for tonight. I'm trying to teach you the good and the right way, and I will pray for you. But at the end of the day, your relationship with God needs to be such to where you know what to do, and then you do it. Verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in what? Truth. Truth. With all your what? With all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. Every now and then you need to stop and think about what God has done for you. And just remember how He has always been there when you needed Him. God ain't never left you. You leave Him. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But it shall still, but if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, you and your team. See, I, I, I'd love it if we could just end on verse 24 because it's so beautiful. Fear the Lord, serve Him in truth, all your heart. Consider how great things He hath done for you. I'd love to end there. Samuel doesn't end there. He tells him as a closing verse. He says, but if you keep doing wickedly, you're going to be consumed. Oh, and your king will too. Because at the end of the day, it's God who judges all things. And He's who we're going to answer to. Nobody's going to answer to me. i got enough to worry about. I don't have to worry about y'all's sin. i got, I got my own to worry about. At the end of the day, we're going to answer to Almighty God. So let's do the best we can with what He's given us. Let's live our lives in a way that's well-pleasing to Him. And let's change some things in our lives that make it harder for us to serve Him. I, I think if, if everybody would just rededicate their life to get rid of some things we need to get rid of and taking on some good habits and some good ways, I think we'd all see an improvement. And I'm not saying that you're not already there. I'm just saying you can always improve. All of us, me too. Any questions? Any thoughts? Anybody? Anything? Appreciate y'all being here. I love you all. Ask Brother Enrique, will you close us for the word of prayer? Gracias, Padre, por la oportunidad que nos regalas y el privilegio hermoso de poder estar aquí en tu casa para escuchar tu palabra. Gracias por 